I'm Galina Fedorova, I'm co-founder of Goodler Foundation that is uh, co-hosting this event together with UNFPA. And um, I am an uh, expert on SDG number one. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marco Davanti. I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco and director of the Social Innovation Initiative. And my expertise uh, is on uh, sustainable development. Hi, my name is Stas Hirman. I'm co-founder of three Silicon Valley startups. And now I'm managing partner at uh, TC Ventures uh, Local Seed Fund. So many of you guys have been seeing me kind of wandering around. So I'm actually the Slack representative. My name is Sean Kelsey. I um, actually work in the uh, Accelerator Operations Group here. I'm very interested in uh, community outreach, and I'm not an expert in social entrepreneurship, but I've, I've learned a lot this day, so I'm just glad to be here and welcome to the lab. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing judges here. Um, so a uh, couple of housekeeping things uh, before I pass it over to Oksana. Um, so uh, Grigori asked, um, uh, who's doing the, the videotaping and all the other amazing things with uh, documenting this uh, event, asks you to uh, speak actually closer to the screen if you can, right? Is that like here? Here? The monitor. Mo oh, mo the monitor. Uh, would that be okay with the judges if actually, yeah, yeah right, exactly. That would just uh, give us a better video. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we basically will be presenting eventually here and uh, um, then any other things, Gregoria, that you want to share? That's good? Microphone okay. Microphone next to your mouth. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, so closer to the screen so that um, uh, there is a picture here. Um, and I think that's it. So uh, then presentations are five minutes sharp, uh, three minutes Q&A, and then Exana, it's all yours. I think you've done it all. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. So we have a guideline. Uh, I think the mic, it's important to speak into the mic because it feeds into Gregoria's equipment. Uh, that's how your voice is getting recorded. You have five minutes. I'll put the alarm on and I'll give you one minute warning. And at five minutes, I'll rush you off the stage. I'm really good at it. So keep to your time. I'll, I'll pick up the most annoying one. Um, and then we have two minute Q&A with our judges. So hold your questions for discussions later. We want to power through the presentations. Judges will do a Q&A. Okay, any questions? Are you ready? Yeah. Yay! Okay. Homeless Micro Entrepreneurship by Eileen, Denise, Matthew, and Gavin. Where are you guys at? Don't be shy. Huh? Are they hiding from us? Yeah, they're here. There they come. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Okay, keep in mind, they're going first, so there's a lot of pressure, and also there's a lot of slack for people that go first, but a lot of, a lot of support here. So give them great, great applause. There's a speaker. So we want to tape your presentation, stay next to the screen, and speak to microphone, because that feeds into the AV system. I have it. You have five minutes. I'll give you one minute warning. In five minutes, I'll rush you off. Okay. okay. Uh. Hi. So our way to address poverty is by homeless micro entrepreneurs. So the root cause of Poverty in San Francisco is gentrification. So basically, larger businesses move in to the city and put smaller businesses out of business. So um, small business owners and employees become uh, unemployed and then potentially uh, homeless. So the stakeholders are homeless people because they're affected, local people because they see the homeless people, Government because they try to help the homeless people, local nonprofits addressing homelessness because they're trying to address homelessness, and then local business and corporations because they're trying to help the homeless people. And our solution is that our business sells products made by homeless people. 
So our customer pain points, we have a double-sided market. Our customers are both consumers, locals of the Bay Area, and corporations for locals of the Bay Area. It, it, it pains our hearts a little to see someone on the streets, and we want to we wanna help that. Sometimes we're not sure how. Just by giving them money, you don't, sometimes you don't know what they'll do with that money. Sometimes they're con there's concern that maybe they're using it for something they shouldn't be. By supporting the business, you know that th these are people that are working to make their lives better. Uh, for corporations, uh, there's the new millennial generation is very socially conscious, and they've been putting a lot of pressure on Silicon Valley and big corporations to be socially conscious as well. So if a company can say, hey, look, we support this organization that employs homeless people, it's, it's a good driver for uh, attracting talent. Unique value proposition. We utilize the skills and potential of homeless people to sustainably address poverty while making a profit. We empower homeless to help themselves. They're independent and self-sufficient and they don't need to rely on charity or the goodwill of others. Key features of the solution. This, we partner with local homeless shelters and give workshops teaching business skills and how to turn the passions and skills they have into marketable products that they can sell. Um, our business organization then purchases these products from these micro entrepreneurs and then upsell them. We generate revenue from ourselves by marketing as a social cause. And this, this provides both us revenue and the micro entrepreneurs revenue. We'll have little postcards attached to the products, which will help their, which will help our consumers know that their purchases will directly help this person. It provides that human contact, like, hey, I'm helping Bill here, who's been struggling with living in this homeless shelter. Okay, so uh, going to market strategy. So our strategy is first to sell our products in the markers, uh, farmers markets. So first, uh, because this is just like a starter. So first, uh, we're gonna be giving like, for example, bags to the farmer's market so that people can buy. And then later, once we get a little bit more income, then we're gonna go start up at the Whole Foods organization, for example. And then we're gonna, like for example, like lunch is catered by our organization whose kitchens are staffed by homeless people. So basically, first starting off at the farmer's markets, then we go to the high organizations, which is the, like for example, Whole Foods. Okay, and then understanding revenue and model and cost. So basically, we're gonna eventually be selling products and that's all automatically like getting us um, revenue. But in order to start making the products, we need to start somewhere by getting uh, some resources and those resources cost money, right? So first we're gonna go get some grant. Okay. And then, um, and then that's it. From there, we create the products and we get revenue. So, so how does our solution address the root cause? So what we wanted to do is that we wanted to get the homeless people a more constant supply of income so that they can stop being like homeless. Because 80% of the homeless in SF are actually like relatively temporarily homeless. It's like they just don't have a steady source of income. So providing them this uh, way of getting a steady income so that they can like support themselves is how we can prevent people from being homeless and get people out of being homeless, right? And so we're also trying to break out of this like sense of dependency, like as we addressed in, like yesterday and earlier in like in the movie, is that we can get people to support themselves instead of just giving them a home, food, job, and instead of just making themselves get out of poverty. And so in the future, we hope, potentially hope that we can expand to other societies around the world. So instead of the SF, we can work in societies like India, where our proceeds, where we can help them, where we can help them like, increase their livelihood by you know, giving them a new source of income.
they were there, yeah. So, any questions? Have you looked at other models of their similar to your solutions that have worked in a similar fashion? Uh, I was part of a uh, organization called Nifty Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, but this focuses mostly on students in impoverished areas. It runs uh, over six months. They run you through a business plan. They take your passions and skills, and you make a business out of it. I made a, I started a small chocolate business from this organization, and it's it's helped. It's given me a new perspective on life. I don't think there's one doing this for the homeless community. But it has worked in impoverished neighborhoods for children. So. I made an question, but remark, uh, why you focus on the own products, not on services? Because specifically for homeless communities, they probably should be providers of some specific services that people need, like tour guides, like messengers, like deliveries. Because they know city better than anybody else. So don't focus on politics. One second, you, you guys from Silicon Valley. So don't think about selling food back on farmer markets. Think about scaling up by going online. You, you, you actually the missed link when you could bring homeless products or services online to address much bigger community of uh, buyers than we could achieve in farm. I'll leave it here for the questions. Okay. Um, also, I heard two things about how these products will come into being, and that was workshops and the shelters, and then using the shelter facilities for this production from what I got. I know that the shelters are very problematic, so I would just like to have some more insight into how um, feasible it is to actually produce these products in the first place. I think that's all the time we have for questions, but maybe you guys can have the last word. So what we originally plan is to, like, as we start out, we go to homeless shelters where we, where we already have the homeless so that if we provide them a place to produce these, they will be able to produce it. But then later on, as the organization grows, we plan on making like actual, like having actual facility to facilitate like people like going in, homeless people making um, products. So that's our like later down in the roadmap. Great, thank you, group one. Thank you. Okay, next. Next presentation is from Help Mental. And I don't see you guys' names on the title slide, maybe. Uh, you know who you are. Okay, make sure you speak to the mic. You have five minutes. I'll give you a one minute warning. Okay, let's give a big Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are Help Mental, and we are face dealing the issue that billions of youths face worldwide, which is. Which is stress that can lead to from dropping out from school to even committing suicides. So, here are some scary facts about stress. Um, so, acceptance rate in U.S. colleges have almost uh, been halved in 10 years from 2007 to 2017. Um, one in four people have been bullied at school and those experiences can, can, ex can lead to depression and anxiety. Negative impact of childhood abuse can take a mental and physical toll that, that lasts a lifetime. And one in 12 teens have attempted suicide. So our app is called Help Menzo, and it combines all the high quality resources for mental health issues in one app so that adolescents could just refer to this app to share and resolve their mental problems. So United Nation and United States colleges are some of our big names and stakeholders. So Daybreaker, which is a yoga and meditation 
Foundation, along with One Medical, are some of the stakeholders that have resources. Uh, school districts and administrations and even YouTube channels have information. Um, governments, especially parents, can encourage use of this app and recommend it to people who have mental health issues. Uh, and our target audience is middle school students and parents, and those are those who are affected. And finally, volunteers are some of those with passion. In terms of addressing the problem, we have defined the root causes as depression in adolescence, parental pressure, workload, lack of societal slash family support, and peer pressure slash bullying. By working with the stakeholders and those who influence the students, you are essentially creating a two-way communication between the cause of the issue and the student, while also supporting while also supporting the students emotionally and teaching them how to deal with stress, which is an everyday um, occurrence. So here are some uh, resources that we provide within our app to deal with these root causes. For example, for parental pressure, we have Mental Help Gov or WikiHow, and the same thing for other uh, root causes. The potential impact of our application is a suicide prevention, increase of emotional support for the students who, who have no one to consult with, parent, dep parent depression and men mental illness, and more likely to excel in school. So our business model of the application aims school districts, parents, and middle school students our app is unique in the sense that it provides all mental health resources in one single application. And our, the resources uh, will be checked to be safe and effective in solving mental health issues. Um, our marketing strategy is to use the freemium model and promote and promotion through school districts, media, sports team, and more. Uh, the potential challenges that we might face is that different countries, states, or schools might have different policies for solving mental health issues. In terms of scalability, we can talk about middle schools and mental health care providers within California. And in an even more general sense, we can talk about middle schools in the U.S. by 2020. And from there, we can talk about middle schools in other countries by 2025. So, I'm Koi. I'm Boris. I'm Carm. I'm, Bro I'm Ray. You stayed on time. Questions? Uh, just a question: How you are funded? What is what? It, what is your model? How are you making money to provide your services? So we are using the freemium model, and every student can just download it for free. But how we monetize it is that we provide a paid subscription for access to qualified specialists in consulting with mental health issues within our app. How can you transform the challenge of having those services already provided in schools into a collaborative opportunity for you? Um, also, have you thought about the intellectual property rights of those resources? Um, would they be willing to give you their resources? If not, how would you fund those um, items? Well, I'll address the second question first. Uh, so the resources that we take will, are uh, open source resources that can be uh, searched on the internet. And the advantage of our, app of our application is that person with a problem, he or she can just go into the app and state the problem, and he or she would not have to uh, Google different websites and evaluate, like, should I trust this website, or does it give me wrong suggestions? And in our 
app, um, application, we will make sure that we filter out uh, those uh, that are high quality and will surely help the uh, students with the problems. I'm sorry, I didn't really get the first question. Can I get it again, please? Sure. Can you think about the uh, possibility of collaborating with the schools instead of competing with them? Uh, yeah, so um, I, one of our strategies is that we will um, go to different schools and sh show them that we have this app that uh, will um, help the, uh, um, the already existing mental health services within the school uh, in the sense that students usually uh, need anonymity. They don't want to appear in front of a doctor or someone in the school. And using this app, they could anonymously uh, request for help and uh, seek for uh, pieces of advice. Great. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'm gonna mispronounce it, is it Hygieia? Hygieia. All right, Hygieia team, you're next. I love it, they even branded their solution. Now none of these investors can steal the idea. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Can I? Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I want you all to close your eyes and for a minute imagine. Think of a youngster near you. Can be sibling, can be your colleague, can be your child. They're going through something bad. Anxiety, stress, depression, heartache, schoolwork. And now imagine what you would do. You would reach out to them. Now I want you to think of a child in a similar situation, probably going through something worse, but they don't have anyone to turn to. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Hygieia, the quarterback of well-being. So Hygieia, when we were designing Hygieia, we had to think about the root causes of the problem, and they all revolve around mental health. First is stigma. People don't want to talk about mental health. And there is a lack of awareness. There is, like, we need to normalize the problem, and we don't have that. Awareness. Because we don't talk about mental health, we fail to address it. People are unaware of the conditions of why they're feeling what they're feeling, and they lack an understanding of it. Then, language in inaccessibilities. Because the mental health care provider and the person the subjects speak different languages, they have this language barrier which they cannot cross. And because of money, the services are costly. Why don't you want to go to a therapist even when you have the awareness? Because it's very costly. And all of these we're going to address in our business model. Okay, speaking of stakeholders, we identify a few big names or big companies in the vicinity of San Francisco or other places that have the resources and the initiative to help us alleviate the situation. So not just supplying us with funds, um, these companies will, such as Yelp, they will also help us by uh, uploading the locations that we're conducting these services into the API or database. So they will serve as a form of promotion for us. And of course, nothing that we do will be possible without the right resources. So to do that, we'll be approaching organizations such as NAMI, uh, whose primary objective is to create awareness, provide education, and implement 
programs to help those who struggle with mental illness? Those affected. We are thinking of collaborating with small businesses who will either sponsor us or come present, as you will understand when we talk about our business model. Small businesses such as coffee shops, hairdressers, uh, vicinities providing manicures, pedicures, and grocery stores who can come up, set up stalls to sell local produce that will, we will commission for 10%. Other than that, those affected, of course, are the youth. And with the youth, their parents, their colleagues, and their teachers. All of which we will address in our business model. We will be partnering with schools who are willing to work with our organization. We are going to take advantage of the days that schools have already set aside for, for, for professional development days. They also have funding already set aside, so we will be taking advantage of that too. During the day, there will be no school, so the kids have availabilities to meet in the gym together and go ahead and look at all the businesses and organizations that have set up tables all around the gym, and they can go ahead and receive any mental help that they know that they do need, and as well as help that they even don't know that they need. And at the end of the day, all the kids will go outside and play, hang out with their friends, and that is a time where parents and teachers can also come into the gym, and a third party, such as NAMI, will go ahead and just educate the parents and teachers about any preventative measure, measures that they can take to help their students and kids receive any mental help that they need. So this is effective in addressing root causes rather than just symptoms. It raises awareness in both children and adults attending the event that mental illnesses are not something to be ashamed of. It also creates connections between students and support centers in their community that they can utilize in the future. And it gives teachers and parents tools to help children and teenagers in their lives that struggle with mental illness. This program will be sustainable because we are collecting 10% of each item sold by local businesses present, as well as sponsors and fundraisers. The potential impact and the hope is that we hope to create less stigma around mental health and well-being. We don't want people to think or look down upon any of these issues. The buses will leave, the businesses will leave, but the local resources will stay. We don't want to be the saviors of the world. We want to save the world. Bravo. We're open to any questions that the audience might have. Thank you for the presentation. So you guys offering educational services with this, the, the actual service that you provide. So I, I heard that you're going to be in schools and the youth can talk to you and what is actually going to happen. So they come to whom and what they're going to get out of that. So it's a very informal business model. What we intend to do is that, so um, I'll give you a rundown of the day. So say we're going to Discovery School in San Francisco. We take our buses there, we set up um, everything in the gym. From So there are going to be businesses that want to come up and say, pr provide hairdressing facilities or provide um, food or coffee and stuff. And during that, we'll also have stalls set up that give children information about local resources around them, such as clinics, such as um, um, hotlines and services that they can access even when we're not there, because we're going to be there for a day. We, as we said, we don't want to be the savers. We want to save the world. So we want them to have a sustainable option that they can turn to even when we're not there. And adding to that, the prof dev session is going to happen at the end of the day when the children can leave outside and interact with, um, with the people that we have from different facilities that can help address them these mental problems. But inside the school, we'll have this prof dev sessions for the teachers as well as parents who will also interact with these different facilities local facilities that we'll have over who can um, interact and talk about any topic that's um, prominent in that school or just with youth generally. Uh, just to add to that, um, also that the hairdressers that we mentioned, for example, they're going to be there to give free complimentary haircuts to some of the students. But we thought, why not be clever with this? And we wanted to reduce stigma. So instead of using the word therapist and having a person on a chair in a vacant office that you feel afraid of going to, we made the hairdressers 
people who are also therapists. So yes, they will have like an isolated sort of a corner where you can go to, but they're just gonna be asking you questions like, how have you been feeling lately? How was your day? Are you feeling sad or feeling happy? Because we're targeting K-12 schools. So these are kids from very young age all the way to high school. And so we make a very informal way of doing, yeah, it, it's robust and it's informal. So the kids don't have the fear of going to a therapist. And this actually helps prevent stigma. Thank you. Actually, actually, it's a very cool idea to mix uh, some services with uh, initial assessment of uh, uh, mental health. Question, where, where are you going to find such people? Because it's pretty rare combination of hairdresser or someone who does manicure. And maybe not even a certified therapist, but at least someone who could do an initial assessment. Sure. So just to rephrase your question, you asked how we, how we get local businesses and resources to support our ideas and programs. Not just local hairdressers. Hairdressers. Much harder to bring hairdressers who mm -hmm. could speak and make initial assessment of mental health and mental problems. Where do you find this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we had a discussion about this. Um, so it's not that hairdressers are gonna be eligible, it's that the psychologist or the therapist are gonna be the one who will learn the skills of hairdressing, or like they're gonna be the ones. So it's like they have the degree, but just they're gonna acquire the skills. Also, this is this is um, for this is for children. Oftentimes, the hair dressing that they need is very simple, so we can actually teach them these skills. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Haji. A lot of great ideas. Okay, next presentation is going to be from. Give it up to the firm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these dudes look very serious. Greetings, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for having us. So um, we, uh, so this is a statistics that we uh, pulled out from the UNICEF website. According to UNICEF, three billion people, almost half of global population, uh, lives on less than two point five dollars um, a day. So poverty is very, very real, and the the, the the scale of this operation is is the beauty of uh, of our company, of the firm that we've built, um, and that tackles developing and underdeveloping nations, which constitute majority. Uh, of the countries in the world. And farmers constitute a majority of the population in many countries because many of these countries are agro-based uh, industries. And thereby, our solution pertains to agriculture in specific. These are some of the stakeholders that uh, we've listed. So these, there are the investors, the government. We believe in a top-to-bottom uh, approach. So we believe that we need to set the right precedents, but we also believe that there has to be a policy change that has to, that has to sort of follow, right? And so we give them the example of the resources, uh, and the government ha then has to replicate what we've done. Uh, and so basically, it's, it's an advocacy firm as well as a, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about it uh, when, we come, when we get to the solution. Um, so these are some of the root causes of uh, poverty in these underdeveloped developing nations, the structural and cultural uh, poverty. And 
we plan on tackling both of these. Um, so uh, moving on to the um, optimized solution that we have, here's a line from George Washington. Um, Agriculture is the most healthful, most useful, and most noble employment of man. Um, we believe that microfinancing is the way to go. Um, this firm, so microfinancing companies charge interest rates of over 10 to 20% on average. So that's the stat we pulled out of Huffington Post. And we, we are planning on bringing that percentage down to 5%. Um, because we believe that farmers essentially can't, in poor countries, can't afford these kind of firms, uh, these kind of loans, and thereby, if we if we, if we reduce this percentage, then the farmers are better able to uh, sort of go by economies of scale. Whereby you have larger farmlands, and the, the, the and by having those larger farmlands, you have economies of scale. You have better revenue. So this farmer does not sustain himself and uh, uh, the family, but rather it, it, it the, the revenue pours into the economy uh, as well. So we're going to be uh, doing targeted lending. Right? We're going to be lending money to these farmers in order for them to start their business, to kickstart uh, their farms and businesses. Um, we believe in a top to bottom approach as I talked before. So we believe in advocacy. We believe that after we've implemented the solution, we need to advocate using the farmers unions, using different uh, resources at our disposal, using our network of people. We need to advocate for um, a policy change within the government whereby uh, the government the government sets uh, the, 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 percentage of the percentage of these loans uh, to 5% rather than 10 or 20%. Um, we are also going to be selling micro turbines at cheap cost because we believe in sustainable villages, right? So that is going to be our product, the tangible product that we're providing. Um, we believe that micro, turb so micro turbines produce on average 10,000 kilowatts, which is about po the power to require for an average US home. And, um, uh, and uh, more, moreover, we're going to be using Project Loom as well in order to monitor all of this and in order for better connectivity among the amongst the farmers to give them alerts with regards to natural disasters, um, etc. Moving on, the beneficiaries who are going to be impacted by this. So first of all, we identified that the lack of food is like the major cause for poverty around the world. Maybe not in San Francisco, but around the world in general. So first of all, farmers can produce more crops at a lesser price because of the tools we just mentioned. And this will first directly impact the local communities. And we envision that this would have a reinforcing feedback loop whereby at the long term, we envision that this would impact the whole city because the produce, the prices of the crops would come down. People will be incentivized to, it will be easier for them to buy more. And hence, we would tackle poverty. And finally, the last thing is that since we are bringing innovative technology at the cheap price, the entire country, the state is going to benefit from this economic, they're going to benefit economically from this. Okay. Who likes to talk about money? Because, uh, so we've made a clear analysis of where our money is going to come from. The initially, we're going to get grants and investments, and then we're going to self-sustain through offering consultant services to firms who want our data, uh, partnerships with microfinance firms, uh, giving loans ourselves, and also the energy production from turbines. Then we, the costs, the, the bulk of costs are going to come from wages, our employees, different logistics costs, the research will make so we can implement the right solutions, hardware costs, the micro turbines, and promoting. Then, one of the most important things is the go-to-market strategy. So we have thought that we have to go and rely on the local, the local services or the local NGOs because this needs to be optimized for, from country to country. And then it will be something to be more business to customer. Even though we collaborate with the government, our goal is to, to get to that farmer. Then a good way to do this is, of course, through farming retailers. So those farmers, they go and get their crops or pesticides or wherever, whatever they need at a certain retailer. So we are going to partner with those retailers. And then we are going to look for multinational organization support, such as the UN, maybe USAID, <coughs> or different bodies within the EU. And. Yeah. And finally, uh, it's amazing how the six of us, all from different corners of the world, most of us new to the United States, could come together and use our diverse opinions to create this, which is just a consultancy firm. We didn't want to create a new product or a new app because everything exists out there. We want to be that bridge to channel these existing resources and make the world a better place and eradicate poverty. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? multiple herd of top to bottom approach that does impress me. Okay. 
So who is your, you're actually targeting, who, what kind of farmers are you targeting? Are you trying to bring them out of poverty? Basically, we were very touched from the examples that were given, especially from the movie, where doing good actually ends up doing bad. So we want to, our goal is to touch the farmers that really need these uh, low interest loans. So we have a certain threshold. So when a farmer needs that loan, he is eligible to take that. But if a farmer has become powerful enough to take loans from a local institution, then we're not going to go and just take the money from the local institutions. So there needs to be a threshold when the farmer does really need like a low interest loan and then we'll also offer the consultancy service so they know how to use this and how to make use of that and hopefully be that powerful farmer that doesn't need our loans anymore but takes loans from the local institutions. I commend you for going into microfinance but indeed microfinance is a large field that includes not just uh, microcredit but also microinsurance and micro savings, which particularly microinsurance has been revealed more effective for poverty alleviation for farmers throughout the world. Is your plan uh, uh, planning to have to include also other type of uh, financial support uh, beside the microcredit? So with regards to microfinancing, um, the reason we're making this firm a very uh, economically sustainable by having a product, a tangible product, uh, and then by giving out the micro turbines to these villages and having a particular um, a share over the, the energy that these villages produce, uh, we're making the firm more sustainable monetarily, right? So then we can afford lower interest um, in, uh, um, insurance uh, policies for these farmers uh, in case disaster strikes, uh, etc. So we believe that if our firm is monetarily strong, economically strong, uh, it is only then can we tackle such uh, such uh, such problems. Thank you. Any more questions from judges? Yeah, so the turbines. So if you're with your product, you're trying to reach you know lower lower level farmers. So how are you bringing turbines? Those lower level probably will not need a Ford or anything, those turbines. So you're saying it comes to the, turbines come to the villages and how you approach, that's totally different segment of customers. So you're reaching two different, different segments. May I suggest to have other team members speak? please repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, the question is, it seems like you have two target, different target customers. You have farmers that are, that are lower level farmers, have no money, that's why you're giving them loans, they're under, they are not, not qualified for regular banking. But then you're also offering turbines that are supposed to bring your income, but those, this is some, sounds like for somebody who is already, you know, can't buy it or whatever. So. You, are you working with two different types of customers, or is it the same customer? Um, so these could potentially be two groups of customers. However, um, we also feel that since uh, micro turbines include, you know, all sorts of power generation, it could be through wind, through hydro, through or biofuels, or even um, traditional sources like just regular um, uh, fossil fuels, um, and so. Um, we bring we bring the turbines to the um, villages or in the communities that need um, need these uh, sources of power because we believe that um, the energy is a basic human right and everyone should have this um, have energy to use um, so yes that is one of our expenses um, is to give uh, turbines to villages in need and it could potentially be two different groups of customers, but it doesn't have to be because the farmers in the communities which in which we donate turbines to might also be the farmers that need the low interest rate loans. Um, but these two concepts within our company are a little bit separated. Thank you, firm. We're out of time, but if we have questions from judges, yeah. Okay, for, for my experience building startups, no startup die from uh, lack of ideas, but rather die from too many ideas. 
Your biggest problem is that you're running for two ideas, microfinance, micro turbines, uh, each one very interesting way to improve people's life. But running for two goals, you probably will, will not achieve either. However, just think about it. Why you, you think that you could provide lower interest microfinancing? Why? Why you you going to build? Because it probably will be less costly for you. Yes, why? Because probably by providing turbines, you decrease the amount of default. So why not to focus on one idea, bring turbines and bring other microfinance companies, there is about 50 of them, or maybe 500, yes? Who will be ready to partner with you because you will prove that for your community, which you already have foot, uh, foothold, default will be less. But because you already there, you already provide energy, and people probably will, taking money, will return with high probability. Partner, don't build everything. Whatever you could partner, use other people. Yeah. Uh, we, we actually mentioned, it was called the optimized solutions, because our solutions will be optimized according to the country. So in a country where it's let's say it's something it's like Kiva is working very well, microfinance firm, we're not going to kind of waste our resources to go and compete with Kiva, but we'd rather collaborate with them. But if somewhere we need to implement that, then when at a larger scale, or if we could even from the beginning, depending on our resources, we would do that. We should have the capacity to, to do that in countries that don't have the technology. And I think to your point of uh, adding more complexity, we actually initially thought of adding blockchains and all that to improve, <laughs> the, to improve yeah. the security and reduce poverty, but yeah, we didn't do just, that. Just a quick remark, yeah, and uh, I totally hear where Sal is, uh, is, is coming from. And, uh, you know, in the morning we um, uh, introduced uh, an example about uh, two co-founders in Borno founding four startups simultaneously in different industries. And changing situation well now if they did have uh, service providers they could engage as partners that would have been different stories so you don't need to reinvent the wheel right if you do have people uh, organizations to collaborate I totally agree with us however um, it's good I think I mean I, I personally really appreciate that you uh, try to um, look at the bigger pictures outside of your like uh, one customer segment and one solution to see how uh, the systemic con uh, connections might occur and actually leverage uh, use a leverage points of the system so just thank you for that thank you Pearl. so next team doesn't have a team name what is the problem Woo! yeah <laughs> So uh, I, in real life, I work at a high school. Uh, and something that breaks my heart almost every day at work is, um, is seeing students that aren't able to succeed or students that fail, or students that drop out because um, they're not able to uh, focus on the academics that they um, are presented with at school. Um, you know, I'm sure people here are familiar like with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like people that are not supported at the most basic levels are not gonna be able to succeed. Um, at higher levels uh, of thought. So that's what our solution uh, is targets. We target uh, adolescents and young adults experiencing poverty in uh, blighted urban areas and experiencing poverty because of systemic, systemic lack of quality education, um, being unemployable at a young age um, because they don't have a lack of familial or parental support and because they're not employable they obviously don't have access to a professional network. So in the context of this presentation, uh, we represent a group that uh, wants to partner with an organization um, to employ and propel teenagers that drop out of high school due to their uh, level of poverty. So. so here we come to the name of our product. But first, I want to ask you who ate a burger in the last month. Okay, let's talk about burgers. <laughs> so, 
We are the company that wants to help companies around the world that are already well established build new brands within their companies. First of them, Max Social. Pretty bold for an MVP, but we want to uh, open with them a new division of restaurants. Restaurants where we employ these students that he talked about. These students that lack money, lack education, and need our attention. Who are the stakeholders? First, we need a big name. We need something, uh, an entity that can help us franchise because they know how to do it. They already done that. So, who has resources? McDonald's and consumers because the consumers will pay a premium price knowing that they will have a social impact while eating a burger. So, where do we get information about these children that we want to employ? High schools, boys and girls clubs, and homeless shelters. All in all, we want to go further. We want them, after they're employed, to go back and study. So we need to partner with GED program, community colleges, and McDonald's to make this dream possible, to make these children go to school after they're employed for a period of time and they get back on track. So for those of you that aren't aware, McDonald's and fast food in general has an image problem. Um, their product right now is viewed as unhealthy, unhealthy and irresponsibly produced. Um, there's been a lot of bad publicity and media in the past 15 years, such as uh, the Super Size Me documentary um, with um, Morgan, I can't remember his last name, but uh, yeah, the Super Size Me, that was like in 2002, and then the new movie, The Founder, uh, came out last year, and that really exposed a lot of the corruption and the, kind of the bad politics that happened um, within McDonald's. And this has led to decreased sales and decreased market share for McDonald's at large. So our proposition, um, which is, for those of you that didn't catch it, employing um, underfunded youth uh, in McDonald's for these different benefits, uh, this will provide a moral balance as consumers will view the company as socially conscious. Uh, disengaged students will gain income, marketable experience, uh, self-esteem, a GED program, mentoring and support for community college. Uh, and consumers will want to consume these products because uh, it's a socially responsible contribution to society. So, what do we need to do? We need to partner with McDonald's, develop personalized strategies for our partner's brand. This is why uh, we are thinking about expanding this type of partnership. Started with McDonald's, continuing with Starbucks and other brands that expand globally. And we want to make these deals personalized because in Romania, my country, we don't have uh, many high school dropouts. Thank you. Uh, but we have other types of problems like uh, the community of uh, Romi, the gypsies as people call them. We need to employ them, we need to integrate them into society. How, uh, how we get the money, uh, premium pricing, and we as a firm are sustainable because we sell this model to McDonald's, we sell this model to Starbucks and other companies. And the costs are the ones for training, mentoring, and also providing all of the services to bring the kids back to school. Okay, so just to sum everything up, the impact is increasing uh, the employable population. Uh, it increases the high school educated population. It provides a bridge out of poverty, uh, breaking the cycle of poverty. Uh, it's scalable, replicable, it can be tailored to a variety of different market and corporate situations, even different restaurants or different populations like refugees. And it creates an atmosphere of psychological encouragement and um, other support. Before we get our questions, we would like to invite the whole team here. So please, a round of applause for them too. Thank you so much.
Okay, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. It's great to see you guys change the change the way you were thinking. So it's uh, it's great that you're coachable uh, in a great way. Though my question would be: so McDonald's, I I thought they already employing everybody who cannot get a job anywhere else. So what I um, and I know that for, for uh, that's a fact. But um, the whole problem with them is that they're they're they pay so little that people continue to stay in poverty. So your GED and um, community college, uh, is this gonna be a mandatory thing? Or is it, you know, so if people are to be employed there, would they be, would they need to go through the college to improve themselves? Or, because otherwise they'll stay at the minimum wage and they won't be able to survive at least in the Bay Area for sure. Uh, so the idea, uh, which originally arose as a way to avoid creating adverse economic competition that would work against the entrance of, of McDonald's, would be to create, either through conversion of existing franchises or through the creation of new restaurants, restaurants that would exclusively employ students that match the, the, the prerequisites for this program, which include um, a lack of proper uh, support at home, such like psychological poverty, not necessarily just financial uh, poverty, that they have not completed the four-year high school education course, um, that they would maintain involvement in a GED program concurrently, so that uh, they weren't that it wasn't just a job; it was an opportunity for them to have the cost of completing their high school education uh, alleviated um, because of the lack of the support they would have. Um, Ordinarily, and then through that, they would also be able to have be able to continue in a, into a higher education environment subsequently. So I think the question was how they yeah. will actually support themselves. Being then employed by McDonald's is not possible to do it. No, no, they, they answered the question. The question was, would it be mandatory? And he did say that it's um, it's part of their. They will be employed, yes. and that's a part of their curriculum. Yeah, that's part of the curriculum. Gets support. Do you understand correctly that <coughs> buying uh, McDonald's, not McDonald's, Mark, uh, whatever, uh, Mark, Mark Social, I will pay premium. Uh, I will pay more than I will pay for McDonald's. How are you going to make me as a consumer aware why paying more? I see five dollars and ten dollars. You probably need to think about the way telling me that this five dollars going as a premium for GD exam or whatever else. How, how are you going to do it? Okay. Uh, the idea is that these restaurants where we implement the program have the MEC social branding uh, on at the entrance. We will use uh, the machine that is uh, McDonald's marketing to promote this uh, this new trend and people will know from popular advertising from Facebook the internet and also in these stores on on the walls instead of the new McChicken with uh, three types of salad uh, we will have the story of Johnny that uh, were, were made the burger for for you and uh, in uh, the same time, we, uh, you will pay a bit more, but he will get his college degree in five years because of you. Yeah. You need to get customers to be readable. So probably not just Johnny going to get, but his achievements. So for me, for customer, I'm ready to pay five more dollars per, uh, per burger. If I see that paying five dollars next week, five dollars. If I see half group of these people improve their GID. So you need to show this in dynamic because in fast food business, the most important, not new customers. It's easy to bring new customer. It's very hard to keep him, especially if he have to pay premium. Yes. Why, uh, why I started with uh, this individual example is the fact that when we start the program, we don't have numbers already. What we can do is we can talk about who we have at the moment, but the strategy long term is to provide numbers. Look, this is the impact we had in California. 
how many children now got their GEDs. Uh, this is the number of uh, Romanian poor kids that were employed. This is the number of refugees that were employed in Istanbul. Thank you so much. And I think we have yeah. one more group left, right? Yay. Yeah? yeah. The common mental... Oh, men... I'll, I'll let you... Oh, common mental earth... Mentalhealth.com. All right, five minutes. Common mentalhealth.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to take a look at this picture for a moment and listen to this. For you, for I to lead you to what, to what commonhealth.com is. Surrounded by people yet all alone, trapped within this solitary zone, a world where chaos and hate overtake every bit of happiness that may try to escape. That's a poem by a friend named Trisha. So when you hear about, uh, when you, you know, when you hear that poem, and you kind of like imagine what mental illness is, then if you see someone who suffers to that mental illness, don't you all want to say, you are not alone? Can can I have you guys raise your hand if you want to help those who who suffer with mental illness? Yeah, and say that. You guys are not alone, right? But then, if we take a look and then think a bit, this is not only you guys or us here who also think that way, who also care about that problem. You are not alone saying that, saying to those people that they are not alone. Why? Because there are almost hundreds of organizations tackling about the same problem. But the thing is, if I can say it as a poem, because I like poem, then hearing or knowing this kind of fact is kind of like saying to those who suffer, mental illness, mental illness, mental illness, mental illness, mental illness. You keep saying the word over and over again until it loses its meaning. So what we come up with is with commonhealth.com. And what is that? So at, as I said before, the youth in San Francisco who suffer with mental illness, and then there are also multiple organization and as well as institution who also address that problem. So commonhealth.com, uh, commonmentalhealth.com is a platform in which one together and then connect those who are, who are eager and then passionate in tackling that problem into like one common platform, not to unify them, but then so that they can collaborate, they can connect and they can communicate of the things that they've been doing so that they won't do the same stuff repetitively to the same audience. And then they can also share their data and then their finding so that what they're doing can be more effective. Because we're also um, thinking based on what current finding is. So there's a survey in 2017 saying that in California, there is like youth confusion about mental problem and mental illness because a lot of things are done um, individually and that not integrate. So we're trying to integrate what's out there with common health, uh, commonmentalhealth.com. So part of our unique value proposition, we're aiming to create collaboration and connectivity, and also through that, develop a shared knowledge base. We want to provide all these organizations a, an opportunity to have networking and help them analyze what they already have going on, and then coordinate between the strengths of each organization and help them match to unique, uh, the unique conditions of mental well-being of youth. So, a lot of great ideas start on the back of napkins. So here's a little bit of our napkin drawing. What we envision, when we, especially when we think about websites, immediately what comes to mind, big names are Google, 
Uh, and then for social media, we have Twitter, Facebook. But a, a lot of our discussion also came up centered around Wikipedia and Reddit. So what we want to do is not so much reinvent the wheel, but take what's already existing and to set up this platform. Also, in terms of thinking about why would organizations possibly pay for services, often what we can see is that through their day-to-day -day, um, operations, we can pr provide some sort of digital operational tool. This can accomplish both things. One, obviously, is to help them manage the logistics of what it takes to say put on an event like we're having here or do their daily clinical services whatever they might be offering but also embedded within these tools are data structuring to help us capture key pieces of data throughout their activities and besides taking that back to our platform this is also very valuable in terms of research institutions already trying to do uh, do research in understanding what are the key factors causing mental illness and things like that. And so it, as you can see, it kind of creates this feedback loop as we continue to create value and build this knowledge base. So why this problem affect, is the root cause rather than symptoms? Everyone know that mental problems are invisible. It's not like physical health. People cannot see it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So, our big question for the mental problem is that how to make mental problem visible to everyone, to the community, so the world can know about this assist. So this website, we collaborate, how many, like how many organizations join our network, how many institutions, how many universities related to the problem. So this is not the best way, this is not the only way, but it's one of the most effective ways to make the mental problem visible to the community. And, um by, big, by doing that, um, basically what will happen is that people will feel less lonely as they will feel like they actually have hope and they will actually be connected to other people who can actually help them solve their problems. For the student who is scared to walk into the psychologist's office alone, thinking that he or she might have a mental illness and being labeled by others, he or she in the Silicon Valley definitely can log on to thecommonmentalhealth.com, see the newest and latest research that's been going on at the professors and the masters and the most knowledgeable people in their field. Thank you. I open to questions. Um, so how you, so people with uh, mental health problems, how would they know about your website if they've never been, so your organizations on your platform, I understand it, those mental, that deal with mental health, but those people that never been to those organizations, they're, they're, they're not known to those organizations, how would they, other, those people would know about your website? Go to market strategy. So our idea of generating money first that we apply membership for the for the organizations or research institutions to be part of our platform, but in a way we can also um, utilize them as part of our uh, marketing um, process. So in a way for them to get discount or perhaps like other kind of membership, they would also have to mention us in their own website or in their own campaign. So in a way, we would also promote them and they, we can also be promoted by them. This is the last one. Hi. Um, I actually am very interested in the whole service um, provision that you have in terms of data collection, if I understand it correctly, and other things. So could you go into that a little bit more? So uh, I'm assuming, we're, so we're assuming uh, the fun underlying assumption here is organizations believe that they will benefit from a shared knowledge base, right? So when we're setting up those technical infrastructures here, uh, I, th I feel like a lot of times there's tons of like productivity optimization tools out there already. But what happens is that once the event is done, once the uh, service is completed, the data is often dumped. You know, what, who, who we contacted, who we done. Or if it's not completely dumped, it's in the unstructured data form. 
But if we design our, op our digital tools with that in mind of saying, hey, this data of what happened, the tracking activities all these organizations are doing is important, instead of just kind of dumping them into a void, we actively are capturing them. So it's kind of like snapshots. And also how that feeds back to research institutions is often, they're often viewed as isolated or ivory tower often is, the, at least that was the old term. Uh, but a lot of them are very interested in engaging with practitioners. And we see that using the, with the um, embedded data inf structuring in mind, we can give them direct access to activities that's been going on. And so they can get more real-time data in that way as well. Any questions? I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great presentations. Uh, so let's take five to 10 minutes break so the judges can discuss the decision. And so uh, we'll come back in five to 10 minutes. We'll call you back. Thank you. Awesome. We saw how your ideas were shaping into serious business plans. We do understand that you only had a short period of time. You didn't have to do much time to do research. So as we were judging, we're, we're trying to see, okay, if you remove this aspect and you, you know, with a little bit more research, you add something else to it, if, if would it work? If you do this, if you think a little bit more about that, can it work? And so we were very, very um, generous in our thinking, but we still had to pick one, uh, one team that would win. And for no poverty team, we picked Max Sosha. So please, all of you, come over here. And we kind of thought that it probably wasn't the greatest company to partner with, but we thought maybe that would, if it was uh, Pete's Coffee or something, <laughs> so jump a juice. And but the idea is perfect. Yes, thank you so much, you guys. You can. Um, solution so everyone is the winner but a group is just slightly bit more the winner and that group is Hygia Congratulations. Yeah. as you guys come up let me also say a few words about why this was the choice we really like to positive spin that you have put on mental health and we think that it's really a great idea to partner up with other stakeholders and to um, give teenagers access to 
initial assessment for mental health problems. So congratulations for that. Hey. All right. With this, we would like to thank everybody once again. Uh, thank you, Goodler, and uh, uh, for organizing this amazing event. And uh, look and your mail uh, mailboxes next week for a follow up. And uh, if you can share your ideas on social media, even those that did not win and who didn't did not uh, um, you know end up um, being chosen for this hackathon. Uh, so I promise you a small but interesting prize um, uh, that we will give to uh, well, those of you who are most active on social media sharing these ideas or insights. It could be either idea or any insight that you got from today. And you use hashtags, uh, either traditional hashtags that uh, you were introduced uh, yesterday or the hashtags that, uh, um, uh, that is just uh, Goodler hack and uh, also SDG and number of USDG. Okay, so with that, Tatiana. Uh, give it to Tatiana to, for closing remarks. I'll, I'll do the closing remarks. I want to thank you, everyone who attended this event yesterday and today, and those who attended it today, even if you didn't attend yesterday. I just want to say that we appreciate your attendance. I hope we learn, you've learned a ton. Stay in touch with us. You have our contact information for all of us. You're, if you don't, you know, you're interested in getting in touch with us on social media, on LinkedIn, and other uh, sources. Please come and uh, get our information. And would love to, to see you next year. And we'll stay in touch. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and before the photo, let me just thank on behalf of UNFPA, um, Goodler and all the other partners that supported them. It has been a real pleasure to work with you for the last few months, and this has been a really inspiring and a great weekend. So thank you so much for putting this together. Yeah.